Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Ernie Tedeschi. Ernie is a policy economist and the head of fiscal analysis at Evercore ISI, a macro advisory firm. He is also an occasional contributor to the Upshot section at the New York Times. Previously, Ernie was a senior advisor and an economist at the U.S. Department of Treasury. His research interests include the federal budget, monetary policy, and labor markets. Ernie joins us today to talk about output gaps, full employment, labor markets, and the state of the economy. Ernie, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. We're glad to have you on the show, and uh, it's particularly nice for me since this is the first time we've met in person. We've interacted a lot on Twitter, so I can actually see the face as opposed to the little uh, picture you have up there. But uh, Nothing like Calvin, right? Yeah, no. So <laughs> my image of you is Calvin until today, and, and unfortunately, <laughs> our listeners can't see your face. <laughs> They'll hear your voice. But it's great to have you on, and like with many of my guests, I'd love to know, how did you get into economics? What's your career path that led you here? So I could tell a story that's a fairy tale about how I always wanted to be an economist, <laughs> and that was my life's work. The real story is... It wasn't – while it wasn't accidental, I, I had sort of a sideways uh, path to economics. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a flight surgeon, you know, in huh. uh, for the U.S. Navy. And when that path was, was X'd off for me, uh, when I entered undergrad, I was sure I wanted to be a lawyer. And in fact, I was so sure I wanted to be a lawyer that I convinced the parents of one of my friends – that they wanted her to be a lawyer, and she is now a lawyer, and I'm not, and she blames me to this day for uh, for nice. talking her parents into it. I think that there were a couple of things growing up that influenced me. I think primarily public service. So my dad was in the Navy, um, thirty years in surface warfare. He retired as a rear admiral. Um, my mom was a nurse, and she spent most of my early life taking care of my sister, who was mentally and physically disabled. So she dedicated her whole life to taking care of my sister who needed 24-hour care. And it was only sort of when I went to college, my family lived in California and my sister was eligible for Medicaid and California changed Medicaid so that it would be it would give more funding to in-home supportive care. So that allowed my sister to have, you know, 40-hour a week nursing care paid for by Medicaid and that allowed my mom to go and sort of pick up on her career as a nurse. She completed her bachelor, she got her master's, and to this day, she's a research manager at a local hospital chain in uh, San Diego doing um, studying diabetes. So public service and public policy, I think that sense came from them early okay. on. Um, one other thing was, believe it or not, speech and debate in high school. So the type of debate I did in high school, Lincoln-Douglas debate, is very heavy on political philosophy. So you get exposed to John Stuart Mill, even John Rawls, John Locke, um, Rousseau, Marx. And so I think in the process of just studying up on political philosophy to have values debates, you get exposed to a lot of economics. And then if I'm being perfectly honest, the third thing I would cite is video games. Growing up, really. So my so while my friends were playing Mario and Zelda, I played those two. Uh, but my favorite video games were SimCity and Civilization, which were a sort of you know phantom way of exposing me to. I mean, what is SimCity if not a microeconomic or a you right. know, regional macroeconomic model that you get to interact with and and budget for and build infrastructure all the time? And and I and that had more of an effect on me than I think I realized. Um, uh, until my undergrad years. Interesting. So how did you go from in college, you know, studying economics to the policy world where you are today? So when I was in college, one of the last classes I took was a like a practicum course that put you in an internship. Um, I was a public policy major in college. Okay. I, I, I chose public policy because um, I, I had taken some economics classes and people – and this is interesting. People rag on the teaching of Economics 101 – Economics 101 was great. It was after Economics 101 when I started taking like the microeconomics core and econometrics and, you know, microeconomics at the undergrad level, at least at Stanford where I was, 
was just entirely Lagrangians and solving for equations. And like I came out of that micro class as an undergrad, n- really not having any sort of appreciation or sense of what microeconomics really was. Macro was a little bit better, but um, – and then uh, econometrics was exactly the same way. Um, that was – the year I took econometrics was the year of the 2000 election. And literally the last day of the class, the professor saved – his first applied example of econometrics for the last day of the wow. class. It was all matrix algebra. <laughs> Sounds you know, awful. As an um, undergrad. As an undergrad. And, and so finally the last day he's like, you know, why don't we apply what we've learned in this course to, you know, the, the, the ballot measures in Florida and like see whether um, Pat Buchanan got more votes than we would have expected, you know, uh, given other aspects. And, and it was like, it was like this revelation. It Way was like, to turn off students. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is what econometrics is about this. And <laughs> so, right. but whereas the public policy degree was much more practical okay. and drew on economics, politics, sociology, and, and, and was applied um, and showed you how to, to use it. So anyway, the last, the last course I took in public policy was a practicum that um, landed me an internship at county government. Um, the county of Santa Clara in California, and I worked for a local county supervisor. And that was like going from the ivory tower to nitty gritty monitoring changes in social services that real people receive, infrastructure, public safety, you know, courts, jails, all of the actual services that um, local governments provide. And so there was exposure there that um, made me appreciate economics more. Uh, I think too, uh, my wife and I got married around that time. And then for our first year of marriage, we did AmeriCorps in Eastern Kentucky, building houses. So that made me think more about economics and development. And then after that year was done, my wife got a Fulbright and we spent a year in the former East Germany, um, which made me think even more about development and economics. And, right. Um, sort of how that all interacts. And to this day, we have the debate about which was more of a culture shock to us coming from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it was definitely Germany. But, uh, <laughs> but um, Eastern Kentucky wasn't far behind. It, it was, it, yeah, it was, um, it was interesting. We had a great experience in both places. But it real like, it, I think it's impossible to be in places like that with such divergent sort of economic paths from what right. we were used to and not think about economics. This is the Appalachia the part of the country. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Coal country. And um, I, like while we were there, we were hearing the first sort of conversations about opioids and um, oh, wow. how that epidemic yeah. was beginning. And it was like, I didn't even know what opioids were. And people were talking about, you know, family members that they knew getting addicted. And, you know, this was in 2003 and I had never heard of that before. Uh, and yet locally, Everybody knew of it as a, you know, sort of burgeoning problem that was that was spreading. So, um, yeah. So I think that all, sort of all of those life experiences pushed me that way. Now, how did you end up at the Treasury Department? So my first job in D.C. was at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Okay. W- which you can think of as like a think tank. And I was doing federal fiscal policy for them. So the, so the story of how I got to Treasury was very much a story about institutional constraints. Pew – is a great place. They, you know, they hire great people. They have a lot of money. They do a lot of good work. But you could write a whole book about the sort of institutional and political constraints of family foundations. And you know, when when your family name is on a foundation, you know, they, you know, whatever scrutiny an academic might give to a paper that's going out, you know, a family foundation is going to double or triple that scrutiny. And so Pew was very much against doing anything in the written language that was controversial or could be misconstrued. And like this, this often ended up being an issue with third party scholars that we would contract with was their, their work would go through like a gauntlet of red ink oh. and like several different rounds of edits because Pew was very, very low risk, risk averse conservative with a lowercase c about what it put out. So, But what that did is we realized that while written reports got scrutinized that way, charts and data visualization often didn't. So if we could say something with charts rather than words, that was a much easier approval process internally in the building. So right after the Budget Control Act of 2011 was passed, that was the first time that people had heard the word sequester. And they were wondering, well, what, what is the sequester? What are the implications of this? So I said to my boss, I said, why don't we just do 10 charts in like a chart deck? 
um, about the sequester. And to my my recollection is that that was one of the first sort of visualizations and analyses of the fiscal implications of what they were talking about as part of the Budget Control Act. So we released it. And from what I'm told secondhand, Secretary Geithner, Secretary of the Treasury at the time, saw this and said, we need to be able to do that sort of thing in-house. And then the chief economist, Jan Eberly, said, well, why don't we just hire the guy that did this? Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> and so she basically cold called me and was like, do you want to come in and talk about your piece? And I said, sure, just thinking like I was going to talk about the analysis. And right, right. And she ended up, you know, pitching a job to me. <laughs> That is an amazing story. Uh, yeah. So it's just uh, the other way around, right? Yeah, usually, yeah. <laughs> You're begging for the job. Here's my great piece. Um, yeah, it was. she was doing the hard sell and I was not prepared for that. <laughs> so uh, so I folded. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Now, you spent some time in there and um, something we were talking about before we went on the show, I thought it'd be good to bring up here is you learn a lot in grad school, but when you get out into the actual policy world, there's a big difference between Lagrangians, for example, yep. are doing sophisticated macro models. Uh, we had a previous show, Juan, talking about Hank models, yep. doing something like that and then actually doing policy work. And do you have any examples of that? I mean, I, I got plenty I could talk about. I'm sure you had some rich stories you could tell, too. The, the one that comes to mind is the hardest memo I ever had to write when I was at Treasury. So, so technically, I worked for the Office of Economic Policy, but really, like, I was part of a team of three. We were like, we called ourselves an analytical SWAT team because it was like Secretary Geithner or the chief economist or the head of public affairs could yep. basically come to us and be like, here's an interesting question. Can you guys analyze this and write this up? So that worked really well for economic questions. You know, how is economic growth doing? You know, how, how is the labor market doing? That sort of thing. The hard questions came with the sort of look back on the bailouts, TARP, and how to account for the extraordinary measures that Treasury and the Federal Reserve had taken during the crisis. Because there, there was no internal consensus in the building, even about how to account for those programs. You had many different sides of the debate. Um, and you had Secretary Geithner, who had opinions, but also wanted buy-in from all of his different assistant secretaries and undersecretaries. And so the, my, so the background on my phone was this was the White House picture of the day from, I think, 2012 huh. uh, or, so, or no, sometime in 2013. It's uh, obviously the listeners can't see it. It's Secretary Geithner showing a memo to President Obama in the West Wing. I'm nowhere in the West Wing. So it's unlike a lot of other Washington yep. backgrounds, but it's my memo that I wrote that was like four months of going around the building and basically trying to negotiate like, all right, what are we going to show the president about how these different programs have done? And it was literally a compromise. Like I had never – like coming into Treasury, I would always thought, oh, economic projections, forecasts, you know, coming up with point estimates of different programs. There's a right answer and there's a wrong answer, right? And you're either right or you're wrong. And then you come into the sort of internal debates – in a real life policy setting, and then you realize quickly, no, it really is a negotiation like any other. And it's not that you're honest or dishonest. We definitely thought that the numbers were honest, but you you try to get all the buy-in from the stakeholders that you can for the analysis that you're doing. Uh, and that was eye-opening as well. Yeah, no doubt. I saw a lot of that as well. It's not an easy, you know, yes or no question. It's a question of how do we answer a question? Do we have buy-in, as you mentioned, from all the people above you? Right. And other competing parties in the, in the U.S. government. Exactly. Um, but also, I mean, I found little things like how do you properly measure data? Do you use year on year, quarter on quarter, month on month, seasonally adjusted, non-seasonally adjusted? Things that at least I didn't think a lot about in grad school that became a big deal when you actually had to look at a country's economy. Um, that was a big deal. Then there's some operational mechanisms you don't think about. And something – more recently in this job I've become aware of, and we've had on the show, debates over the Fed's operating system. I'll just give mm -hmm. that as an example. But right. you know, in, in grad school, you talk about sort of a macro model. What do you want to do? We target inflation, the price level, you know, what type of framework you set up. 
But then you, you actually have to go do it in practice. It's a very different thing. And, and how do you actually implement it? And a lot of us don't think about those issues until we're put into the position where we have to actually implement them or advise people on them. So it's good to have someone on the show who's been through this process. Well, many before. scars. Many <laughs> scars to show for <laughs> to it. Show, yeah, exactly. Now, something else that's interesting about you, Ernie, is that you have an amazing title. <laughs> you didn't know I was going to bring this up, but I'm going to. But you are a Fed whisperer. Oh. And by that, I mean you have been cited twice in the speech speeches by Chair Powell. And so that means he's he's watching you. Just just like uh, Geithner was watching and reading your work, you have Powell now reading your, your work. And so tell us about that. How did uh, that come about? I, I, I hope Powell likes video games then if he <laughs> reads my work. Um, so I think I think the ones he cited, I think he cited the disability piece that I wrote. Yeah, for, the New York the Times. Yeah, so um, I, I can I can just kind of launch into that. So sure. w- w- one of the themes of my work is, you know, what are the nuggets of insights that we can glean that are in these rich, wonderful, you know, government official data sources that aren't necessarily well publicized. So in the case of this particular piece for the New York Times on disability non-employment, the story was um, disability non-employment had been rising uh, for more than two decades. It, by you know, if, if you had if you had stopped the clock at say mid twenty fourteen and just looked back it would have met just about any definition of a secular rise. And here I'm talking about prime age, that is 25 to 54-year-olds who are not employed and um, in this case not in the labor force either and also saying they don't want a job and the reason that they cite in the current population survey is because of disability or ill health. Been rising um, for more than two decades. And then it reaches this peak in 2014 and then it starts falling. And it starts falling for basically the first time over at least that 25-year period. And I've gone back and I've, I've looked at other data sources and it's, you know, it's, it's robust to even looking back 50 years. That beginning in mid-2014, that, that rate started falling. And it's, you know, when I wrote the piece in 2018, it had fallen by 7% from its peak. It has continued falling since then. And as a matter of fact, I should probably write an update of this, but it's, it's, the disabled non-employed are one of the biggest sources of hiring in America today. That is like people who transition out of disability non-employment are basically making up the bulk of the added employment among prime age workers today. And I think that the reason why that was interesting probably – you know, in gen- it was interesting to me and probably the reason why it was interesting to Chair Powell was because – you know, the the story that economists told themselves around 2013, 2014 was, okay, you know, labor force participation is low. It's really not coming back, maybe a little bit, but it's low because there has been the secular increase in people who are detached from the labor force and they're not coming back. And one of the prime examples given in that narrative was disability. You know, these are um, – some people blamed our disability policy programs, you know, um, Social Security Disability Insurance, SSI. Some people just blamed widespread health issues. I, I think now we, you know, I, I don't remember this term being present in 2013, 2014, but I think deaths of despair is the way we might talk yeah. about it now. Um, people who were sort of plugged in knew about the opioid crisis. I think that's there's much wider appreciation, but basically for whatever reason that those people who were out due to disability were not coming back. And we can talk about this more later. Um, you know, there were a litany of forecasts of labor force participation that came out in 2013 and 2014. And they basically all agreed that labor force participation was not coming back. And obviously that was wrong. But, you know, to be, to be, to be totally fair, it was wrong for the right reason, which was that up until mid-2014, they had no reason to think that – labor force participation was going to come back except for some sort of theoretical belief that you know if we can sustain the recovery then it will eventually reach people on the lower rungs of 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 labor labor market attachment um and so i think that the the, the conclusion of the piece that people who were disabled were coming back into not just the labor force but employment i think led to the conclusion that okay maybe our estimates of slack in the labor market were actually underestimated this whole time. And really effectively, there is more labor supply that we can bring in from a hot economy. 
Yeah, that's an amazing story. I mean, on, on two levels. One, it speaks to what disability is doing and providing. Maybe it's making up for a flawed social safety net system. So people are using it kind of as a backup mm-hmm. safety net, number one. But in terms of our conversation today, it speaks to the importance of how hot can you run the economy. Right. And that, it's, you know, the Fed could have tightened sooner, could have tightened more than it had. Um, but it didn't, and maybe in part because Jay Powell was reading your work. <laughs> in part, I mean, you know, I'm sure there's other considerations that went into the decision. But if the Fed had, you know, given up back in 2013, 2014, because everyone had concluded that structurally we were at full employment, then we wouldn't have seen the change in the disability numbers. And so that's an important point. And and I think too that our our sense of slack before 20, you know, slack is a very loaded term and it's much debated, but I think it's fair to say broadly that our sense of slack was a very sort of short-term flexible sense of slack. And I think that the fact that this long secular trend in increasing disabled non-employment reversed itself in 2014, it, like it really sort of turns that on its head and it opens up the possibility that there is longer lagged what you might call medium term slack that if you can actually get the if you can get the recovery sustained for a long enough period of time um then effectively you've taken something that looked structural and maybe under some definitions was structural and turned it into something that's cyclical yes i completely agree with that and and here's the analogy i've used and i'll use this as a segue into our, our next dis- point of discussion but i've used this on the show before and it's been some time so i'll invoke this example again but imagine, Ernie, you're bench pressing 500 pounds. Mm, okay. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of imagination. <laughs> okay. But, okay. And you get sick. Yep. And you don't hit the gym for six months a year. And you go back and you can only bench press, say, two, 200. Sure. 250. And because you've lost muscle mass. Right. And, and you're, you're, you're pushing, you're exercising. And you can go in and exercise and just maintain that and, and be in decent shape. And your full capacity is 250. Right. But what if you pushed yourself harder? What if you ran yourself hot? You know, right. you you really strained, you really pushed the limits, and slowly you build up to 300, 325, 350, 450, and eventually you get back. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a difference between your true your true potential of 500, your medium long run potential, and your short run potential. Right. And I think that's the point here is that we get caught up maybe in a short term potential level of economic activity versus what's possible if we really push the limits. Now, I think we both agree there's some point where you wouldn't want to go past that because you would become inflationary and there'd be too much stimulus. Um, but let's move in that direction. That's kind of the first big thing I want to talk about. What is a hot economy? Mm-hmm. And that's something that's very pertinent to discussions of Fed policy as well as fiscal policy. But I want to begin by, by talking about this from the perspective of potential real GDP. And we'll come back to labor markets sure. we were talking about sure. a few minutes ago. Um, but when we talk about potential real, real GDP, that a term that often comes up is the output gap. Right. So help my listeners understand, how do we know what potential real GDP is? What are the typical approaches to measuring it? And, and again, are we doing an adequate job? So it's a great question. I think probably the best way to talk about potential GDP is you, you, you think of it as the level of GDP that you would be operating at under full capacity. Now, There are a lot of sort of debatable qualifiers that you would add to that. I like to think about – I'd like to think about it as full capacity under current policies because I think that listeners of yours, for example, who engage in the nominal GDP level targeting debate can very easily see that potential GDP is in many ways whatever the Fed says it is, something that's consistent with the Fed's mandate. Um, I think it's also full capacity that's consistent with non-monetary policies as well. Um, obvious one is immigration. You know how much, uh, how many immigrants are we allowing into the country? Um, our tax policy at a given time, how much it incentivizes investment, that sort of thing. So, so, so I think, so I think that we could we could get into the nitty gritty and we could talk about a lot of things that go into that. But ba- basically, I think it's full capacity output. Um, it's measured in a lot of different ways. There are simple ways of doing it. So one, you know, one way that you can measure it is you can just use statistical filtering techniques over a long period of time that basically take historical information and use that to infer 
um, what potential would be at any given point in time. You know, the, the sort of classic example of that is you take the log of GDP or maybe GDP per capita. Uh, you can go back to 1870 with some amount of reliability and you just kind of graph that and you draw a line. You draw a best fit line and you see that like, oh, there, there's like a more or less constant growth rate of – uh, GDP over the last, you know, 100 plus years that we more or less were more or less mean reverting to over time. That's sort of a good, you know, I think if not econ 101, maybe econ 102 approach to illustrating the point, right? But there are some there are a couple of problems with that. You know, one is the classic policymaker problem, which is that um, when you're a policymaker responding to a downturn in real time. Right. So let's not think about the perspective of 2020. Let's think about the perspective of 2008, 2009 and the fog of war ahead of us. And we're not sure, you know, we have some theories about what's going on. Obviously, the financial system is a big part of the downturn, but we're not sure how bad it's going to get, what the best policies are for getting it. And, and, um, and, the issue is that those sorts of statistics, sort of naive statistical approaches, will be biased toward the downside of potential GDP at the end of their forecasting period. So uh, this is not inventing fire. This is a mathematical point. You know, they're going to be, you know, if we're at the beginning of a downturn or kind of at the, the trough of a downturn, you know, a statistical average is going to be biased to the downside because those are the most recent reads. And that was, that was a lot of, I think, even with more sophisticated techniques at the time, um, you know, Techniques using HP filters or um, more sort of built from the ground up techniques that I can talk about in a second. That was sort of a common issue, I think, with a lot of them was, okay, like GDP, we've had this massive shock to the level of real GDP. How much of that is structural and how much of that is coming back? And of course, you did have real structural issues at the time. I mean, first and foremost, you had demography. You had an aging population. My sort of pet theory, I say this on Twitter a lot, is that demography is sort of behind the curtain in just about everything going on right now. Even if it's not the primary factor in some things, it's kind of lurking in the shadows behind the curtain. And it's and I think it's affecting productivity, overall growth, wage growth, you know, labor markets, lots of different things in ways that we don't always fully appreciate. That, you know, that whole process had begun around the same time as the Great Recession. So, um, but it was hard in real time to sort of disaggregate those things. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to sort of work from the ground up with fundamentals and say, okay, you know, growth has to be equal to, just from an accounting perspective, growth has to be equal to productivity plus hours plus, you know, you know, the employment rate plus labor force participation plus population growth. And like if we can nail down our assumptions for each of those things going forward um, in a well-informed manner, then we can build up potential GDP growth from that. And that's basically the way the Congressional Budget Office does it. They ha- <laughs> I-, I tease them because they they basically have a monopoly on – potential GDP growth uh, estimates out whenever it's it's so funny even at the Fed whenever they use you know the unemployment gap or the the, the, the output gap they seem to always use CBO numbers for that it's the and benchmark it really is I mean okay. and, and and to to CBO's credit in a lot of ways because number one they're very smart people putting it together and two they make it free and public and they update right. it twice a year sometimes once a year but you know relative with some frequency so that I think is a better approach. So that can help you avoid some of the pitfalls of a statistical filter because it forces you to confront your assumptions about, um, you know, let's say population growth. And, you know, whereas a naive filter might lead you to say, oh, population growth is going to be 2%. And you look at that and you say, wait a minute, no, if we're restricting immigration or if the birth rate is down, you know, that's that's an implausible assumption. And so I think think it forces more rigor on some of those things. Um, But- it also runs into a, one of the problems of the not not problems but one of the issues of the statistical filtering techniques which is you know what do we mean by full capacity so to take my original example you draw that best fit line since 1870 that's going to that that line is not going to be at the maximum of gdp in any given cycle that's going to be straight in the middle of gdp it's going to be literally the best fit so that the you know Roughly speaking, the average on both sides of that line will wash each other out, right? Is that really what we mean by full capacity? And um, you know, are are we past full capacity when we're sort of above the historical trend average? 
I think a lot of prior potential GDP estimates have implied that. There's a whole new class of mo- – not totally new, but it's received a lot more attention – models called plucking models where they basically say, no, 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 no. That's the wrong way to think about it, to oversimplify it. Think about, think about potential as literally a maximum and that deviations from potential are like plucking down – on that maximum. And then like a rubber band, they bounce, but maybe not that fast, but they eventually sort of revert to that maximum, not the sort of, you know, mean over time. That tends to be just sort of common sense the way I think about potential GDP. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the most statistically robust or economically robust way of thinking about it, but that makes more sense to me as a way of conceptualizing it. Yeah. When I look at different estimates of potential real GDP, now, I look at the CBOs you mentioned. It's easy to get. Everyone else references it, uses it. So it's kind of like the first place you go. But I've also looked at the IMF. The IMF has output gap measures for all countries. But I'm looking at the U.S. here. Um, the OECD has one as well. And and those those results from those measures tend to fit my priors better than if I do a pure like statistical <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Because yeah. the one with the statistical exercise, like AP filter, it it quickly put you down like, oh, we were at full capacity pretty soon after, say, 2008. Exactly. Where these ones have taken longer. And I was just looking at these and getting ready for the show. The CBO right now has us a little bit above full capacity, mm-hmm. but like the OECD still has us a little bit below capacity. Right. And that kind of gets us to the, kind of the, where I want to go with this. How do we really know if we're at a, with, at a hot economy? And I, I think your answer probably has to do more with labor markets. But the, is there any way to salvage that question or to answer that question using output gap measures? So there probably is from someone more clever than I am. I have seen analysis done where they've looked at sort of real-time dashboard of where the economy is and they've tried to adjust um, for persistent errors in output gap estimates like from CBO. So, you know, if if CBO is persistently on the downs, you know, or, or CBO persistently says that we're at an output surplus above potential when there's um, not as much inflation as we might think there would be running a hot economy, then those analyses try to um, sort of adjust those, you know, those those forecasts down. I much prefer sort of taking a step back and doing a reality check on where the economy is at a given time. So again, the whole concept of potential GDP is policy contingent, right? It's first and foremost, it's monetary policy contingent. So it's, um, it is full capacity consistent with the Fed's dual mandate, one of which is price stability, which they interpret as 2% growth in the PCE deflator over time. Um, so that right there tells you something about you know, regardless of any other definition, what is the sort of policy contingent, policy consistent uh, read on uh, potential GDP? And so there, like, I I take a step back and I say, well, where is inflation running? You know, where have the errors around the Fed's inflation target run? And, you know, it's it's one thing if it is, you know, if the errors are truly symmetric around the target and, you know, we spend just as much time above 2% as we do below 2%, but that definitely doesn't describe the last 10 years um, or the last five years or the last couple of years. The errors have been to the downside. Um, I look to, uh, as you said, you know, I do look to the labor market and I say, okay, what else would we expect in a hot economy? We might expect employment gains to be slowing to the point where um, they're just keeping up with population growth um, or maybe labor force growth. You know, payroll gains have slowed down. Um, I think think on a 12-month basis, they peaked in 2015 or 2016, and they've gradually slowed down since then. But they're still above the levels necessary to keep up with the labor force and with population. And, uh, And then, you know, I look at wage growth and I and I say, you know, is is wage growth sort of consistent with, you know, past experiences where we thought we were at a hot economy? And, you know, can we easily explain why it why it's not at those levels? And, you know, wage growth has been accelerating. It's wrong to say that wages have not been growing, but they're not at, le- you know, they're not yet at nominal levels, at least consistent with where they were um, back in 2000. So, so I look at kind of all these things and I say, well, okay, from a, from a sort of dashboard reality check standpoint, we're not checking many of the boxes of where we would expect to be in a hot economy, the way that we've defined hot economy. You know, if we were talking about 
a 1% inflation target, you know, we could have a different conversation about that. But that's not sort of yeah. where policy is yeah. right now. So it's useful to step back with what you're saying and not look at any one indicator, but look at a, a broad, you know, range of indicators that would give you a big picture, a broad picture of what's actually happening. And what we see is not a hot economy. And, 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 I, and, and I think the takeaway here, and I, I hope I've conveyed this without saying these exact words, is that all of these estimates of the output gap are so uncertain, particularly in real time, yeah. um, that they are sort of a – they're a useful benchmark for policymakers. But again, put yourself in the shoes of that policymaker facing the fog of war, doesn't know what's happening in the future, and you're, you're presenting her or him with these real-time estimates of the output gap that may be overly sensitive to the most recent reads of the data. That's why I think particularly in the real world, when you have to make policy decisions that affect real people's lives, it's always good to take a step back and, and do a reality check and, and say, you know, are we really seeing what we think we would be seeing under a hot economy? Now, that's great advice. Had the Fed followed that in the 1970s. Um, someone who's come up on the show a lot is Orphanides. He did some work on the 1970s, mm -hmm. and he found that if you use like a Taylor rule, which the you know, Taylor rule has as a part of it, it has an output gap term and an inflation term. And, and what happened is he argues that the Fed was, in fact, following something like a Taylor rule. A lot of people disagree with this, but he, he found it was. The problem was the output gap measure was highly flawed in real time. Right. And so the Fed was just getting bad information. Um, so maybe that's one of the contributing factors to why inflation took off. That's his argument. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your argument is, well, if that's the case, step back and look at a, you know, a wide range of indicators to get a better sense of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear to our listeners, what we're really kind of dancing around here is the Phillips curve. Right. The Phillips curve you know, gives this relationship between slack in the economy and in inflation. So more slack, we'd expect lower inflation. Right. Less slack, the economy's running really hot, higher inflation. And you know, personally, I'm someone who doesn't find the Phillips curve that useful. I, I like to think in terms of money supply, money demand. Uh -huh. That's the, the monetarist in me. Right. But I think this is the flip side of the same coin. On one side, you can think of a money supply, money demand relationship. The other side, you can think of as a Phillips curve relationship. They should be telling similar stories. Um, but any thoughts on Phillips curves? I mean, some people like Adam Ozimek says, hey, they're still salvageable. Just use a wage me right. measure or, or the prime employment uh, rate. Um, what are your thoughts on using Phillips curves for policy analysis? So I think that what's interesting is that the original Phillips curve from the 19, I think it was the 50s was the original paper, yep. was a wage Phillips curve. So it was Phillips relating unemployment in the UK to growth in the wage. I think that the wage Phillips curve is actually very robust if you make the proper adjustments for um, – on the one hand, demography is, again, the sort of the big change yep. over time. Um, so one way of showing that is by using prime age employment rates, so just people 25 to 54. This also works if you do something I like to do, which is demographically adjust the employment rates so that you keep the proportion of each age group constant over time rather than have you know old people make a gradually greater share of, of the employment force. And then if you look at wages that are adjusted for compositional effects, so the best measure for that is the employment cost index. So that's wage growth, but it's wage growth that isn't affected by, um, say, uh, some of the effects we might expect later in a recovery where more low-wage workers are coming in. When you look at a naive average like average hourly earnings in the payrolls report, that, that growth rate can be brought down because – low skill workers are coming in and they're pulling down the average of wages. But that's actually – that's a good sign, right? That's not a bad sign. Right. ECI adjusts for that. So when you, when you combine those two measures, ECI on the one hand and prime age employment on the other, um, the, it, it's you – know, I think the R squared is close to 90 since 1994. It's a very good sort of robust indicator of, of accelerating wage growth. The price Phillips curve, of course, is what the Fed pays a lot of attention to. I'm sure they pay attention to the wage Phillips curve. But the price Phillips curve gets, I think, a lot more press. And there I think the evidence – I'm convinced that the evidence is that it has flattened. That is like the effect of any change in unemployment or labor market utilization on prices has gone down over time. But I don't think it's disappeared entirely. Um, I think that when you make proper adjustments on expectations and um, you sort of – um, I, I've, I've seen exercises from, say, Olivia Blanchard, 
writing at the Peterson Institute um, and other exercises that I think have convinced me that, no, it's still there. It's just it's harder to see and it's much more flat and shallow, um, but the effect is still there. Um, I think a lot of what's going on is actually kind of a parallel to what happened in the late 1990s. So in the late 1990s, Greenspan was comforted by the fact that uh, an increase in productivity was taking price pressure off of the increase in labor market utilization and the increase in wage growth. I think that we're seeing a similar phenomenon now, but not with productivity. We're seeing it with labor share. So literally, j- just from an accounting standpoint, again, and you know, accounting identities are not causal models, but I think that they're a good way to sort of conceptualize what's going on a lot of times. Wage growth literally has to be the sum of productivity, inflation, and the labor share. I look at sort of the increase in wages that have been happening recently, and the action is not in productivity. Productivity is still very slow. Some theorize that product, you know, an increase in productivity might be around the corner because um, businesses are going to try to invest more in labor augmenting technologies. That could be. Um, we haven't seen a lot of that yet. And the action is certainly not in inflation either. Inflation has been more or less steady at 2% or just a little bit under. Um, most of the acceleration in wages that we've seen has been on the labor share side. And so labor share could be sort of acting as that same dampener that productivity did in the late 1990s. Now, the question is, why is it doing that? Like, what's the story there? Short answer is I don't know the answer. There are a lot of possibilities right. um, that are be there are a lot of hypotheses about the labor share that are being thrown around. One is that it's because of lower labor bargaining power over time. You have fewer workers and unions. Um, you have more concentration um, of firms. And so they have more wage setting power. This could be yet another effect where um, where demography is having an effect, you know, an aging population over time. I'm not sure. Um, there are a lot of possibilities. It could be though that the tight, whatever those possibilities are, it could be that the tight labor market is one way to counteract those effects that we've seen, um, particularly since 2000. Some analyses have pointed to a declining labor share since the early 70s. I think that once you adjust for things like depreciation. You don't see that as much since the 70s, but you still do see it since 2000. Oh, and ob- I'm sorry. And obviously, um, trade openness, I think, is may- – a big role. Exactly. Yep. may also be having an effect there too. So it, yeah, so that, that could be explaining part of why the Phillips curve has been dampened over time. Yes, yeah, so the Phillips curve hasn't been the most useful – at least the price Phillips curve hasn't been the most useful for the Fed. But we can still look at these labor market indicators, as you've said – and and I want to move to your work on this because you've written for the New York Times. Again, we mentioned, you know, Jay Powell has read these pieces <laughs> and cited them. But I want to motivate your articles by recalling an infamous, and I stress the word infamous here, piece written in 2014, a Brookings paper by some Fed staffers. And the title was Labor Force Participation, Recent Developments and Future Prospects. And in it, they kind of concluded, or they did conclude that this was it. You know, we, we've reached the point of no more gains. You know, they, they projected that the uh, labor force participation rate might go down to, to 61%. Mm-hmm. Instead, it's actually risen. And I believe I've read somewhere that you estimate about 2 million additional people have entered. If, if, you, if you translate the, the change in the labor force participation rate into actual numbers, mm-hmm. is that right? About I 2 million right, more yeah. jobs. So that's a pretty big amount. <laughs> and again, it goes back to the earlier point we made that had the Fed given up in 2014, had the Fed concluded this is it, like the analysis suggested, this world would be a far worse place. Right. So you have done follow-up work, and I want to move to your New York Times piece that was titled Participation in the Hot Labor Market. And one of the points you make in this piece is whether the change that we have seen, despite this Brookings paper prediction, is it due to people leaving the labor force or coming in? And tell us what you found. So that particular piece was part original research that I had teed up for something else, and then part what ended up being a response to a paper from the San Francisco Fed arguing that the the heat in the labor market was entirely because of a fall in labor force exit rates, okay. not a rise in labor force entry rates. So for listeners, you can decompose 
a change in labor force participation by a change in you know the rate of people coming in and the rate of people leaving, and that's called the bathtub model, and because um, it you know it it depends on the flow coming in and then the flow of of, of water coming out in this case. Uh, so I found that I, I found the conclusion from the San Francisco Fed paper provocative because it would imply that the way the hot labor market is working is by um, making things so that uh, perhaps for existing workers. Um, Conditions were good and so they didn't feel like leaving the labor force, but it wasn't necessarily reaching people outside of the labor force. And I I, I wrote this piece earlier this year. I had already written the piece about disability and, and, and it, the, the San Francisco Fed piece struck me as provocative and it also struck me as counter to what I had found in my other pieces, which is, you know, there are these um, – The disability piece, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. There, yeah. there were these, you know – what we thought were tenacious um, margins of non-employment that were coming back. So right. I wanted to figure out what was going on here. You know, it was not necessarily a contradiction. It could have been that, um, for example, you know, I looked at prime age workers in that disability piece, for example. It could just be that disability had been falling because they were aging out of the prime age category. Huh. You know, good point, right? So. So part you know part of a lot of this research is you you hear smart arguments from other people and you just go back and you double check your work and see what more you can say. So so it turned out that in this case this is actually more of a wonky data issue. Um the San Francisco Fed piece was based on month to month transition data um between people going from not in the labor force which for listeners that means that not only do you not have a job but you're not looking for a job. And into the labor force, which can mean that you're unemployed, meaning that you don't have a job, but you're looking for a job, or obviously that you're employed, you have a job. When you look month to month, there's actually been a lot of research showing that in the current population survey, which is after all a survey of human beings and asks them um, what they think, uh, th the distinction between the labor force and not the labor force, when you're talking about people who are, you know, don't want a job and they're therefore not labor force participants or do want a job and are therefore unemployed, oftentimes that distinction is lost on normal human beings. And so when you look at the same person over time, they switch back and forth from technically not in the labor force to um, in the labor force because they're unemployed and back again. And it's, a, um, it's an issue that we've known about for a long time. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. So what happens if um, – we try to correct for obvious instances where somebody has a random month where they're unemployed, but like really the other months they were not in the labor force and we correct for that. Or what happens if maybe we give them a little bit more time? So rather than looking month to month, we look over 12 months and say, all right, maybe they need 12 months to kind of come to a new equilibrium. And the conclusion I came to was it goes, you know, the, the effect of the rise in the labor force goes from being mostly due to labor force exit to being about half and half due to labor force exit and labor force entry. And, uh, and I came up with a bunch of different adjusts, you know, so I, I, I made adjustments to the CPS to, to look at, to look at how that affected the month to month numbers. I looked at the unadjusted year on year numbers without getting my grubby hands in the data. I, I did it a whole lot of different ways. And, um, the, the finding was robust to those changes. So, um, basically what I concluded is, um, yeah, reductions in labor force exit are an important part of the story. It's not just drawing people in. It's keeping people in once they're in. But drawing people in is also a very important part of uh, this recent labor market story. So it confirms the finding in your disability story. Right. That, that people are entering the labor force that previously were not right. in the labor force. Exactly. And again, going back to the bigger point, is the economy hot or not? It, it indicates that there's still – Room left for more people to come in, right? There, there's still slack out there. Like we talked about earlier, you know, going back to disabled workers, they're still one of the biggest sources of flows into employment, that, you know, in 2019, this year. So when I see people that were what we used to think of as a tenaciously sort of disconnected margin of the labor force coming back in such large numbers, um, that on my sort of dashboard – I say, okay, that that's probably a good canary in the coal mine that there is more room to run and we have more um, potential, if you will, to grow further. Yeah, you have another article that also speaks to the strength of new entrants coming in to the labor market. And this is an article titled, Pay is Rising Fastest for Low Earners, One Reason Minimum Wage 
And we'll get to the minimum wage part. But you also cite in that article that low wage growth has been relatively strong. Right. Due in part to the rec- the ongoing recovery, right, keeping it going. So, so speak to that, and then also speak to the minimum wage finding. You sure. Have. So, so the the sort of money chart, literally in this piece, is um, wage growth by tercile. So, I divided up the American population into thirds, just because I could call it highest, middle, low. I thought that yeah. was simple. Um, and remarkably, for uh, this does not happen often. The Wage growth among the lowest tercile, the lowest third, is now greater than it is for the other two categories of workers. It's all, – all three groups have basically accelerated since about 2013, 2014. But it's just been over the last um, couple of years that we've seen people at the low end really rise above where the other two groups are. And, and I think that that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, that when you let a recovery last long enough – you you start bringing in the lowest skilled, the most um, marginal workers outside of the labor force, and um, giving them opportunities to come in. And you know this is something that Chair Powell has cited a lot now yeah. too. Is one of the reasons why we want this recovery to go as long as possible. And where does minimum wage play a part of the story? So so we get so minimum wage, of course, is like this long lasting, uh, perennial, you know, very spirited debate in economics, and it's a it's a great debate to have. It's an important debate to have in public policy. Going back to like one of the themes in my work of trying to find sort of interesting nuggets of insight that aren't necessarily broadcast. I think we get so caught up in the debate over whether the minimum wage is a net benefit to society, which again, is a very important debate to have. But then we miss like there are there are less bold but still important conclusions that we can come to about how the minimum wage is affecting the economy right now. I had actually written an earlier piece for the New York Times that just described, you know, how even though the federal minimum wage has been stuck at $7.25 nominal for more than a decade now, state and local governments had stepped up in an, in a historically extraordinary way and raised um, many of their minimum wages to the point where the average minimum wage worker in America was facing a minimum wage of really more like $12 an hour huh. on average rather than, you know, which is a far, which is a far cry from the $7.25 right. that you would see if you just looked at the federal minimum wage. So then for this piece, I said, well, how are those state and local minimum wage increases affecting the wage data? And I emphasize in the piece, this is not this is not coming down on either side of the net benefit debate because right. by definition, only the workers that win from a minimum wage increase are counted in the wage data. But I wanted to know how it was affecting the wage data. And what I basically found was that for workers in the lowest third, obviously minimum wages only affect workers in the lowest third, um, it was increasing their wage growth by about 80 basis points from where otherwise would have been. That basically accounted for all of their premium over, say, where middle wage okay. workers were. Um, so while – and I'm very careful to make this distinction. While we can attribute – um, most of the acceleration in wage growth since 2013, 2014 to the hot labor market, when it comes to that little bit at the end, the premium of low wage workers over some other groups, that we can attribute to these minimum wage hikes at the state and local level. And I, you know, because I'm a Fed watcher, I had to connect it to monetary policy at the end. The thing I pointed out was we don't want minimum wage hikes to give us a false signal about the health of the labor market. So obviously, uh, in you know my sort of dashboard, I would look to wage growth as one of the signs of the health of the labor market. Minimum wages weren't a giant effect on overall wage growth. But when you look at overall wage growth, they are adding about 40 basis points when you look across everybody okay. on average. So that can be about, you know, a year's worth of acceleration. And the point I made was we don't want to we don't want that to lead us astray to make us think that the labor market is tighter than it really is. Um, it's That's a great point. You yeah. got to be careful in the interpretation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let me ask this question. And I know you said earlier you, you, you can't look at this finding as shedding light on the net effect of minimum wage. Right. But still, I, I have to ask a question sure. along that, those lines because sure, sure, it's sure. very fascinating. So one of the maybe arguments for raising the minimum wage is that it's not really a binding constraint. It's, it hasn't kept up with inflation. Sure. So even if you did raise it, you know, you still haven't reached the marginal productivity of that minimum wage worker. Right. So you're, you're still – you could increase it without going above what they really would cost you or, right. or the return you'd get on that worker. Right. So 
And I thought that, you know, that's a reasonable argument given that many of these wages, at least at least the federal hasn't adjusted for inflation. Now, you've mentioned that the state and local adjustments have increased, but the fact that they were able to pass through, might that not suggest that they're not binding yet? In other words, if it was really a bind, if, 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 the minim- if the real minimum wage got to a point that it was higher than the marginal product mm-hmm. of the minimum wage worker, at that point, you think a firm might substitute into capital or find right. some way around it. But since we see it being translated into higher wages, could it be interpreted that as a sign that the minimum wages still haven't reached the binding constraint level? So again, I would not call this conclusive, but one of the things I was worried about when I was doing this analysis, what, you know, so basically the way I did it was, um, if you're an economist listening, it, it's it's a variation of a shift share analysis where I keep the share of workers earning the minimum wage constant, and then I look at the change in the effective minimum wage over time, and then I I use that weight to infer its effect on overall wages. One of the things I worried about in doing that calculation is, well, what if minimum wage hikes do have a negative effect on employment, um, and the share of minimum wage workers is gradually falling over time? Um, so I went, I, I kind of panicked one night. I went back and looked at my data. I did it a couple of different ways. And I found out that no act, well, number one, the way I did it would still, you would still see a smaller and smaller effect from the minimum wage over time if that hypothesis were true. But the other thing is that the share of minimum wage work has been gradually rising over time. Again, not conclusive because it could be that there is a sort of, um, there is a gross downward effect on the share of minimum wage work, but that's overwashed by the amount of people you're sort of bringing in by raising the minimum wage and like capturing all those workers. But that's at least consistent with the idea that in some places, in some states and localities, the the ones that um, probably feel comfortable raising their minimum wages, we haven't reached that threshold yet. Um, And so it's, you know, like I said, it's an open question where that threshold is and how far we want to go. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, some places like Puerto Rico. Right. Minimum wage is too high <laughs> relative to the marginal productivity and what what they can get paid. So it is a binding constraint there, but in other places maybe it's not. It's- right, and and that's and I, you know one of the I I didn't write the original piece about state and local minimum wages to make this point, but one thing that was often mentioned to me, and I I understand this argument is in some ways maybe it's a maybe it's a better policy to devolve minimum wages to the state and local government because they know what real labor market conditions are on the ground they can make choices i i get that i i worry sometimes that when you have geographically limited minimum wages arbitrage for employers is to you know like let, let's you know think about the dc area if maryland set a very high minimum wage you know it's uh it would be easier to cross it'd be very easy to cross the border and avoid it even though you might be entirely capable of paying it by by making other adjustments, uh, some people would say that that's the, you know that's a feature, not a bug, right? Uh, so I, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, so I, I do see the appeal of having geographically um, localized minimum wages. Okay, Ernie, we're near the end of the show. I have one last area I want to cover you before we end, and that is what what has happened to the stance of monetary policy, say over the past five six years. Has it been too tight? Has it been too loose? And the reason I ask this question is because, one, the Federal Reserve has lowered its natural rate of unemployment estimate. So if you go back to 2013, it's above 5%. Now it's down to 4.1, I believe. And that's that measure of of, uh, unemployment they believe is the lowest you can go without generating inflation, even though we're below that. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll adjust that down (laughs) as we go forward. And even Chair Powell has admitted they've they've had to adjust that downward. And going back to your discussions about the output gap measures not doing a good job. So what is there slack or not? And I want to ask that question because I've been someone who has been critical of Fed policy. So they've effectively been too tight, not intentionally, Mm -hmm. but they've, they've, you know, unintentionally have kept it too tight. I have a colleague here, good friend, someone who's really smart, who's argued on the other side Alex Tabarik, and he's a previous guest of the show, had a great show with him about long-run economic growth. Um, but he had a, a post, a blog post, where he asked, what is full employment? And, and he argued the other direction. And he made a, a claim that we can't really say the Fed was too tight. And let me just read one sentence where he uses his children's height as, as an analogy. So this is what he said 
And it's a great piece. I would encourage your listeners to take a look at it. But he said, my children are taller this year than last year, but that doesn't mean I could have accelerated their growth by feeding them more last year. And so his point is, you know, we, we see unemployment continue to go down. This doesn't mean we could have stimulated the economy more in previous years. Or maybe alternatively, maybe the Fed shouldn't have raised rates in previous years. What is your response to that based on everything we've talked about today? So I agree with you. Listeners should definitely read the Alex's post. I think it's an interesting argument. I, I was struck, though, by that analogy about his children because uh, I think we know that how tall they can potentially get is affected by diet and and how much we feed them or the quality of what we feed them. I mean, certainly every development metric that I've seen about lower income countries versus advanced countries has focused on average height of of, of adults. Um, I think that I think that the the better way to put it would be, and I'm going to put this in terms of what I think the Fed error was, would be: What if you thought your kid was done growing, and you fed them less or fed them less quality food, and then you found out later that you were wrong, that in fact they were still growing, and you could have had through nutrition, you could have had an effect on how big they got, how tall they got, and I think that that summarizes what we see as the as the error over the last um, four years in Fed policy. It's not, as Alex argues, it's not that unemployment has continued falling and that is ipso facto an error. That's not, of course, the unemployment rate, labor market utilization takes time to recover. The issue was that the Fed thought that we were at or close to full employment in late 2015 and there were Fed governors and presidents, um, mostly presidents, who who said so in 2015 um, and they were wrong. I mean and, and they were clearly wrong because um, the, the evidence have, has borne them out since then. So they, they tightened too early and I think more and more Fed officials are admitting this publicly. I know Governor Brainerd basically said this in her um, – in a speech she gave in New York a couple months back, that that was premature. And when the Fed makes a premature policy mistake, it can certainly affect actual employment. I think we all agree on that. I, I certainly, hopefully we agree that the Fed can affect actual employment. And and I also believe like going back to my research talking about you know how hot labor markets are bringing back people that we thought were gone forever, um, like, like the disabled – I think too the evidence shows that the Fed can somewhat affect uh, the natural rate of unemployment as well. That if the Fed sustains a recovery for long enough, then the sort of full employment consistent unemployment rate can fall over time um, as it brings more people into the labor force. And I think that was the nature of the mistake made in 2015 and 2016, which they've corrected since then and I think admirably have faced up to the – you know. If not their mistake, then the sort of you know the the uncertainty around where full employment is and and how far they have to go. So this goes back to your earlier point about a, a short run, full potential real GDP versus a medium to long run. That there may be two different things, and or my analogy of you know bench pressing two hundred and fifty pounds <laughs> and that being your limit here and now, but you could push yourself and get to back to five hundred. And again, there would be at some point some true limit, right? right. 500 pounds is your true limit. There's nothing you can do short of taking steroids. And we know that's that's not the option you want to go down. So I think that's a fair critique. That's one I've been making. And I think we both agree on this point. I agree with that. And you know, I would add that the nature of the Fed mistake in 2015, 2016 was they were acting on faith that inflation would show up. Uh, and it didn't. So, you know, I would hope that in the future that they set a higher bar for when they tighten policy. And the other thing, too, is not all people share this view. Alex may not. Um, I don't know if you do, David. But I also think in terms of the asymmetry of the errors here. So especially after we've been running inflation, where inflation has come, you know, so persistently below the Fed target for so long. I know that this is a matter of debate in the Fed's framework review about how to make up for that in, in, you know, in future strategies. I, I certainly understand for economists who grew up with the specter of inflation in the 1970s and 80s, how they are still guarding against that, right? And that's a mistake that they don't want to make again. On the other hand, you know, I think about, you know, in terms of the, the asymmetry of the risks here, if we go a little bit over on the 2% target, um, and we're making up for some of the past shortfalls, and that means that more people are employed, 
right? And and maybe maybe inflation gets a little bit out of the comfort zone where it's at like maybe 2.5. So I see that as a more acceptable risk than being too safe on inflation, being on the low end of say like 1.5 and not employing enough people because at the end of the day, you know, one is a measure of prices and I understand that um you know we want to guard against inflationary pressure getting out of control but on the other hand when we look at the labor market that's the well-being of families and Americans and and to me this just goes fundamentally to what I see as the point of an economy we have an economy to deliver and distribute resources and well-being to actual people right and so at the end of the day you know I would rather take the risk of going a little bit over on the inflation side but employing more people rather than undershooting where we could be well said. That actually is an argument for level targeting. In fact, I'd say it's an argument for nominal GDP level targeting where you take away that guessing game. Right. You 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 just you do correct for past mistakes and you allow the chips to fall where they may based on real and price level adjustments. Um, but that, that's a whole different discussion. There you go. And we are out of time. And our guest today has been Ernie Tedeschi. Ernie, thank you so much for coming on the show. David, this was great. Thank you so much for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.